Here's an introduction to light to accompany chapter five of the textbook Astronomy from OpenStax. So light, there's a couple different ways to look at it. Uh, we can think of it as a wave and as a particle, and both are true. And so let's uh, first consider light as a wave. So light as a wave, it's described by the laws of electromagnetism. Um, so this, uh, these laws link electric and magnetic fields together, uh, along with uh, stationary electric charges and, and moving electric charges, which we call currents. Um, it's, it's a fascinating field, uh, mostly governed by uh, Maxwell's equations. And most of these we don't really need to know for the purposes of this class. Um, if, if you want to know a lot more about this, you could take Physics 2002, or the calculus-based version is 2052, or you know you could go on, if you really like it, to, to Physics 4031 and get the undergraduate advanced version. But for our purposes, we just need to know that these laws of electromagnetism, they govern how electric and magnetic fields are linked with uh, charges. And uh, when we talk about light waves, we often refer to these as radiation. Now, you may think of radiation as being uh, radioactivity, um, for instance, from a radioactive decay of a nucleus, or as ionizing radiation. That's often what we mean in everyday language when we use radiation. But here we're talking about the full electromagnetic spectrum, everything from the ionizing radiation, like a gamma ray, down to something completely harmless, like a radio wave. Now, light uh, travels at a fixed speed, um, and in a vacuum where there's no other matter, there is the uh, the speed of light, c, is this constant. This is roughly 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Um, this is known as the speed limit of the universe because nothing can move faster than this. So when light is moving through outer space, there's no matter that it's going through, it moves at uh, this speed. Um, light can move slower in, in a medium, for instance, like uh, like water or inside glass, but we're not going to worry about that for this class, okay? We're talking about space, and so our light is moving at uh, the speed of light C. Now, the speed of light, interestingly, um, it's this fixed constant. It's equal to the product of the wavelength and the frequency. So wavelength times frequency gives you, gives you the speed of light. Um, so you, as you know, you can get light in a variety of wavelengths. For instance, the red wavelength of the visible is much longer than the blue wavelength of visible light. Um, but the speed of a red piece of light, a red light wave and a blue light wave, is the same. So how do you do that? If your wavelength changes, that means the frequency changes in the, in the opposite direction to account for that. So what do I mean by wavelength and frequency? Let us consider a light wave here. So we have some um, light wave. Uh, what we're looking at in the vertical direction is you'd really think of as probably the intensity of the electric field, so how strong the electric field is. And at any point in time, this will bob up and down. And I have a gift to show you in a moment if that's unclear. So the difference, or the distance rather, between these peaks of the wave, this is known as the wavelength. And then the number of, um, of these pulses that you have, the number of cycles that you go through per unit time, is known as the frequency. Okay, um, so let's look at an animation. So the simpler case is this mechanical wave down here. Let's just follow one bouncing ball. So we have this bouncing ball, it's bobbing up and down. The frequency would be um, the rate at which this bouncing ball does one cycle. So what you do is you would measure the time it takes for this bouncing ball to go from the top to the bottom and back up again. You do one over that time, so divide by that time, and that is the frequency. Or you can think of it as the number of cycles per second. So you could measure how many times does this bouncing ball go from the top to the bottom and back up again in one second. And it can be less than one, right? Or many times greater than one. And then the wavelength is just the distance between these, these peaks here. So at any given moment in time, you see that there's some fixed distance between the peaks, and that would be the wavelength. Now, light waves are a little more complicated. We don't care so much about it for this class, but a, a light wave is actually 
oscillating electric and magnetic fields, and they are perpendicular to each other. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, you can measure the distance between the peaks, and that would be the wavelength, and you can measure the time it takes for a peak to pass, you know, for instance, how long does it take, um, or how many of these, uh, these peaks travel through here per second, and that would um, be your frequency. So those, those are your uh, frequency and your wavelength of, of light there. Um, so let's just do an example. Uh, so for instance, yellow light, so this is the peak uh, wavelength from the sun. Um, the yellow light has a wavelength of roughly 500 nanometers. And so let's calculate the frequency that that light has. So because the speed of light C is equal to the wavelength multiplied by the frequency, we can do some algebra to solve for the frequency of our yellow light. So we will divide both sides of this equation by the wavelength, right? And then wavelength over here will cancel. And you get that the frequency of yellow light is equal to the speed of light C divided by the wavelength. So that's equal to our, our speed limit, you know, roughly three times 10 to the eight meters per second. Uh, you can divide that by the wavelength, 500 nanometers. Now we need to do a unit conversion, right? Because we have meters per second divided by nanometers. We need to get these in the same unit here. So we're going to convert our nanometers to meters. So one nanometer is 10 times uh, 10 to the minus nine meters. And so those two will cancel. And then your meters will, can will cancel. And you'll have six times 10 to the 14, you know, roughly six times 10 to the 14 times one over seconds. Okay. Uh, one over second, one over a second is a hertz. That's the unit at one hertz. And 10 to, the, um, 10 to the 14, if we do 600 times 10 to the 12, then that gives you 600 terahertz, right? Because 10 to the 12 is a tera. And so yellow light has an extremely high <laughs> frequency. Uh, you have six times 10 to the 14 cycles per second. That's how quickly the um, electric field is oscillating up and down uh, for uh, you know, a wave of yellow light. And um, whoops, my X's there have move to the wrong location, <laughs> but what I'm trying to do here is slash through um, meters and nanometers uh, to show that the units have canceled. And here again, whoops, <laughs> one over seconds is supposed to be showing that one over seconds is hertz. That is a, just a unit. And you know, you can see the textbook for, for more on that. Let's do another example. Let's start out with something where we know the frequency. So when you set uh, the radio in your car, if you've used that, um, you know, for instance, you might set it to the local radio station like 89.7 or something like that. And that is the frequency in megahertz for FM. And so, you know, a typical FM radio frequency is around 100 megahertz. So what is the wavelength of that wave? So again, we can do some algebra. So if the speed of light is the product of the wavelength and the frequency, now we're dividing both sides of this equation by frequency. And we get that the wavelength is C, the speed of light, divided by frequency. So again, we have the speed limit, roughly three times 10 to the eight uh, meters per second. Divide that by the frequency, which we said is 100 megahertz. Remember, a mega is 10 to the six. So 100 times 10 to the six is 10 to the eight. And so we're dividing three times 10 to the eight meters per second by 10 to the eight hertz. Hertz cancels with one over second, and we're left with the wavelength of roughly three meters. Um, so that's just another cool example there. Uh, just so we're clear, you know, light that you're used to seeing is typically a mixture of wavelengths. So with the exception of la you know, lasers and maybe like a neon sign, typically you're looking at uh, sources that have a mixture of wavelengths. So for instance, when you look at the sun, um, that, that white, you know, that light we call a white light, and it's actually a mixture of several different wavelengths, and you can separate these out using a prism, and we'll talk about that in uh, future lectures. Now, what about considering light as a particle? Because light is a wave and a particle. So as a particle, uh, one unit of light is known as a photon. You can think of that as a packet of electromagnetic energy, or like a quantum of electromagnetic energy.
um, you know, your, your eye is so sensitive it can actually detect on the single photon level, which is kind of amazing. And before I get too far here, if you're worried about, wait a second, how can light be a wave and a particle? Technically, everything is a wave and a particle. When you get down to the quantum mechanical level, uh, individual particles, like an atom or an electron, you can treat them as a particle or a wave, depending on the physics scenario, and both give you useful insight. So one photon, uh, the amount of energy that it carries, uh, depends on the frequency of the light. So the energy of your photon is equal to this constant here, h, times the frequency. And that constant h is Planck's constant. And for now, we're not going to be using this for calculations, so don't worry about what the value is. It's a very small number. Um, and you, you can Google it if you want. So it's known as the Planck constant or Planck's constant. So that's just to say that our, our photon's energy, it depends on the frequency that it, that it has. And of course, a brighter object is generating many more photons. So for instance, if we have a 60 watt light bulb, we can uh, convert, you know, a watt is an energy per time. Uh, we can figure out what the average frequency is of the light generated by our light bulb. And um, we can then calculate how many photons we need in order to get to this energy rate here, this energy per time. And um, for a 60 watt light bulb, that winds up being something like 10 to the 20 photons per second emitted uh, from just your 60 watt light bulb, which is of course an incredibly huge number, but true. Um, now the closer you are, the closer your light detector is to a light source, the more photons you're going to intercept. And that's what this diagram shows over here. It's, it's relatively intuitive, right? If I have, if each of these red uh, lines here is a photon, if I'm very close to my light source with some detector of some size, you know, many of the photons are going to be able to pass through that. As the photons travel further away, right, they're radiating away kind of in a spherical uh, uh, geometry, the photons spread further and further apart from each other. And so if I take my same detector size, and that is one patch here, fewer photons are going to pass through that same detector size. So if I want to, at a distance twice as far away, I need to have four times the size of detector in order to collect the same number of photons. And uh, if you're three times away from the original distance, you need nine times as many de detectors to collect the same number of photons. Or another way to think about it is each detector on average collects one ninth the number of photons that you have in your original detector. Right, so here we have nine photons going through a, a single detector patch. And over here you have on average one photon uh, per detector. So this is something known as the inverse square law. And it just means that the intensity scales as one over the distance squared from an object. So in words, the number of photons of a given energy per unit area per unit time, that's something we know as the intensity, it decreases as the distance squared from a light source. So if I have two um, uh, intensities that I'm measuring, and I'm measuring intensity one at distance one and measuring intensity two at distance two, then this is the relationship between those two intensities. Um, so again, the intensity one, this is the number, it's essentially the number of photons, it's not quite, it's essentially the number of photons I count um, per some unit area at some distance. And intensity two would be, for instance, at a different distance a little bit further away. And just to put some numbers in it, you know, you can see here that if I cut the distance to the source in half, so I get basically I'm twice as close, then that results in four times the detected intensity. Okay, so uh, if distance uh, one here is one half of distance two, then I'd have one over two squared, which is one over four, but that's in the, de the denominator. So that then becomes four. So your ratio of intensities is four times, okay? If I cut the distance in fourth, so I'm four times closer than the original intensity uh, detector location, if my, if my detector is four times closer to the source, then you get six ti 16 times the intensity 
in the um, detector. So that is your inverse square law. Now, light uh, comes in many different wavelengths. So this uh, is known as the electromagnetic spectrum. So you have a huge span of, of wavelengths here. And we name different regions of wavelengths. Um, uh, we, give them, we give them different names depending on your region. And they're not all of equivalent width. So for instance, radio, that spans everything bigger than a meter or so. So that's a, there's a whole lot of um, uh, radio spectrum. And that's also why we split it up into shortwave, AM, FM. Um, and there are other radio waves as well. Uh, as you get shorter, <clears throat> this is the microwave, and this is literally the wavelength used in your microwave oven uh, that you likely have in your, in your kitchen or your dorm. Uh, then you go to the infrared. Um, so this is typically when you see, um, when you see thermal images. Uh, this is typically the wavelength that's being detected. Uh, we have the visible spectrum, which is extremely narrow, but of course very important because it's what we use for our eyes. Uh, then as you get shorter, you have ultraviolet. You go on to the x-ray, you know, used for x-ray machines, for instance, uh, to do a, a CAT scan or an x-ray of a broken bone, uh, broken bone. And then the shortest waves that we have, shortest wavelengths, are gamma rays. And so these, for instance, are the, this is the wavelength of um, a photon typically emitted in the radioactive decay of a nucleus. So huge, huge range here. And all of these wavelengths uh, you know, matter for astronomy. So there are observational astronomers who sometimes specialize in one or just a few wavelengths because the equipment can be very different, the observing techniques can be very different, and the science targets can be very different. So the gamma rays, you know, you can these are just examples. There are many things you can do with all of these wavelengths. Gamma rays, for instance, you can look uh, uh, for radioactive decay from element formation in space, so from nuclear reactions in space. X-rays, there are these really cool things called X-ray bursts that I study for my research, that um, it's, it's basically um, an explosion on the surface of the neutron star, and the typical wavelength emitted by those explosions is in the X-ray, so you'd use it for that. You know, we can jump, there, there are examples for all of these, uh, but just for instance, infrared, if you're looking at um, a uh, object in the solar system, and you want to see its, its properties, um, you can use the infrared. So for instance, there's an object in the asteroid belt called Ceres that's kind of like a dwarf planet. Um, infrared was used to detect water on that object. Um, and then let's go all the way to the radio. If you look at pulsars, so these are rapidly spinning neutron stars, um, then uh, you, know, you can observe those in, in the radio. And your telescope, as we'll talk about in the next uh, uh, one of the future lectures, um, where that can be located depends on the wavelength. So radio can penetrate all the way to the surface of the Earth, as can the visible, uh, which is you know probably no accident because we that that we see the visible wavelengths. This is one of the few that makes it to the surface of the Earth. Um, and most of the other wavelengths, you need to have a satellite or be on the International Space Station to observe anything because they get uh, absorbed in the atmosphere. So any warm object is going to emit a range of wavelengths. So this would be the thermal radiation emitted by an object. And by warm, I mean literally everything. So you, for instance, are emitting a range of wavelengths right now, um, just the same as the sun is. Um, and then, so how warm that object is, which by that I just mean the temperature, that's going to determine the intensity of the light emitted at each uh, wavelength. So we often make an approximation here that's usually close enough to be true. And for this class, it, it, we'll just say it is true. We assume objects are black body radiators. So all we mean by that is that all light of all wavelengths is absorbed by an object. So basically like a, you know, like a purely uh, purely black object will absorb all visible wavelengths anyways. And then we assume this object re-emits those. So it absorbs that, but, but at different wavelengths. So it absorbs all that energy, and then it re-emits just based on the temperature of the object. So this is known as black body radiation. And we can take a look at the intensity of light as a function of wavelength. 
and following one of these curves, that is what the intensity looks like as a function of wavelength for a fixed temperature. And so um, the intensity you can think of as the number of photons. And it's, it's no accident that, for instance, the visible wavelength, the light that we can see, peaks uh, for a black body of 6,000 Kelvin, which is about the surface temperature of our sun. Uh, then as you go to uh, cooler objects, the peak wavelength, so where you have the highest intensity, that goes to longer and longer uh, wavelengths. Um, so for instance, an object such as you is, is way out in the infrared um, in terms of peak wavelength. So the um, wavelength with the highest intensity, which is known as the peak wavelength or the maximum wavelength, is directly related to the temperature of the object. So the maximum wavelength, the, the wavelength where the intensity is maximum, so for instance, this peak right here, this is equal to 2.9 times 10 to the 6 nanometers divided by the temperature in Kelvin. So we, we have to use temperature in Kelvin for this particular uh, set of units in this magnitude to work. So the maximum wavelength, again, is 3 times 10 to the 6 nanometers divided by temperature as long as you're using uh, units of Kelvin for the temperature. And this is known as Wien's law or Wien's displacement law is another way it's frequently referred to as. Um, so just for as an example, let's take an incandescent light bulb. You could measure the maximum wavelength emitted by an incandescent light bulb. It's 1300 nanometers. And so we can calculate then what the temperature of that bulb is. Um, so we take Wien's law here, 2.9 times 10 to the 6 nanometers, divide that by the wavelength, and that gives us the temperature. So we've just done some algebra here, right? We've moved temperature over to the numerator and moved wavelength down, down to the denominator. Or another way of thinking about this is you could multiply both sides of this equation by temperature and multiply both sides of the other by temperature, right? And things will cancel. Or, no, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. You can multiply both sides of this equation by temperature, and um, one of those would cancel. Uh, and that's another way to think about it. Or, you know, um, well, you guys know how to do algebra. <laughs> so <laughs> all we did is we just solved for the temperature. So 2.9 times 10 to the 6 nanometers divided by 1,300 um, nanometers, the, the peak wavelength of this. And you see that that uh, incandescent bulb filament is around 2200 Kelvin, which is 3500 Fahrenheit, which is really hot. And now you can maybe appreciate why it took Thomas Edison so long to optimize the light bulb, is how do you heat something to 3500 Fahrenheit and have it stay that way for any amount of time without melting? It turns out to be very diff difficult, and you, know, you need very uh, durable metals like tungsten to do that. Another interesting thing that's kind of an aside is because it's so hard to heat things up to high temperatures, incandescent light bulbs are actually extremely inefficient. So if this is the spectrum, so intensity of light as a function of wavelength for an incandescent bulb, because we can only heat it up to around 3500 Fahrenheit or 2200 Kelvin, the peak wavelength is actually in the infrared. We can't see most of the light that is emitted by your incandescent light bulb. So what the light that we're absorbing with our eye is a small fraction of the total light emitted, and this is part of the reason why incandescent light bulbs are just sort of a waste of energy. Most of the light goes into stuff you can't even see. Okay, another thing that we should know about warm objects, so again, we're considering objects as black bodies, is that the amount of light that is emitted uh, depends on the temperature. So we can approximate our star as a black body, and we get something uh, here um, that relates the flux from your object. So this is the amount of light per unit area. This relates the flux to the temperature of the object. And here I'm calling this the effective temperature because we're assuming that the object is a black body. So for this class, effective temperature and temperature are the same thing, but I just want you to know the truth. This isn't technically the exact surface temperature of the star. It's an approximation of it, or any, any astronomical object. Um, and so this flux, the amount of light per unit area, is related to the temperature through the Stefan-Boltzmann constant. Okay, 
Now, because dealing with flux, the amount of light per unit area is, is annoying and not always convenient, we can multiply the flux times the area, for instance, the surface area of a star, and we get that the luminosity of a star is equal to the surface area, 4 pi times the radius squared, times Stefan Boltzmann constant, times temperature to the fourth. Okay, so a hotter star, if I fix the radius, a hotter star is going to emit more light. It's going to be more luminous. And it makes a big difference, right? So if my star is twice as hot, it's going to be 16 times brighter because I have 2 to the power 4. Um, and we can use this, this uh, relationship here to gain other information. If I have two objects that have the same peak wavelength, okay, so the same peak wavelength from both these two objects, but one has a greater luminosity than the other, then that means that object with the greater luminosity must have a larger radius, okay? Because the peak wavelength tells you the temperature, all right? And so if the temperature is the same for the two objects, the only way the luminosity could be different is if the radii are different. So that's one way we can determine the, the size of an astronomical object. And that's, for instance, how you can take a look at um, this diagram of stars here, and we can figure out that some of these stars are very massive. So just as a quick aside, we'll talk about this more when we talk about stars and stellar evolution. This is something called the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. The vertical direction is the luminosity, so how bright it is. Um, in a logarithmic scale, so these, you know, you get a factor of 10 per, the, per each uh, dash here. And the horizontal axis is the surface temperature. So not the, not the temperature at the center of the star, but at the very surface. And it increases kind of confusingly as you move uh, to the left direction, uh, just for historical reasons. And so, for instance, if I take an object like the sun, its peak wavelength is around 500 nanometers. It's, it's yellow. Um, that's a surface temperature of around 6,000 Kelvin, close enough. We can find other objects in the universe that uh, have uh, the same surface temperature because they also are yellow on the surface, and yet they're much, much brighter. And so that means these objects are quite a bit larger. And in fact, these supergiants, you know, these are things that are like 100 to 1,000 times larger than the sun. And uh, that is it for this introduction to light um, for Astro 1000.